so so what we wanted to do at the 10 30 mark nashville central time um is have a quick um 30 minute discussion uh on how to train qsar models in the bcl and some things to think about when you're training qsar models in the bcl um and so to do that um i am going to uh, share my screen again and show you some slides and i think jeff and i are going to do this presentation together as well and at the end we'll give you a sneak peek of a bcl user interface um, that does ligand based drug design that's kind of fun and we're looking for people to help with that so we're going to do a sales pitch um, so let me here let me share my screen and i'll let you have it yeah uh, actually and let me let me do something else to log out of all of these things so that way we're not interrupted all right i see shannon's there again and all the people in shannon's room it's clearly the fun place to be uh, all right dude there you go um, very good so QSAR and ligand-based virtual high-throughput screening. So uh, QSAR, quantitative structure activity relationships, basically just trying to predict uh, molecular activity using, um, using just things about the ligand itself. So um, the BCL uh, has a lot of different ways of, of training such models um, uh, here. And, but the ones that are probably the most important, you'll know, so see you know, various ones like listed out here. One you'll one thing you want to really focus in on are the neural network, and um, primarily because other ones in the BCL you're going to find are probably you can find better implementations elsewhere. So, for example, decision tree is not typically used um, for most things these days. Usually, people will use a random forest or a gradient boosted machine. Um, SVMs extremely rarely actually useful anymore for QSAR. Um, restricted Boltzmann machines, where there's a lot of interest in that back in like 2017 or so, 2016. And then we kind of figured out that it's just profoundly slow and also not terribly useful, but it's still there. Uh, so point is, even though we have all these different methods, the main one you're really gonna wanna use 99% of the time is neural network, where we will talk about uh, the other one that you will sometimes use in conjunction with that, is something to indicate how, uh, what sort of space your model has been trained on. And that would be uh, applicability domain cojonen or applicability measure cojonen. These are just different measures of um, the training space of your model. And so they can be used in, in conjunction with that. So um, yeah, and eventually of course we intend to, we'd like to be able to add in support for newer machine learning models such as XGBoost, um, Random Forest and, and uh, TensorFlow, but we just, we need some developer support for that. So if that's an interest of yours, uh, talk to us. We'd love to hear from you. So um, typical model building process involves uh, several components. So um, the biggest one, and honestly, the thing that you will spend, or that I spend at least 90% of my time on, both here uh, when I was at Vanderbilt and now at my current job at HCA, is data set sanitization. Obtaining that data set, cleaning the data, um, filtering it and labeling it are really the challenges, as well as also coming up with all the features and descriptors that you might wanna to use to describe that data. So sometimes you will run into scenarios where you have um, a new set of molecules. Um, I think Ben has run into this several times that maybe have like a new atom type or just new particular properties that are super important for their activity. Uh, and you actually need to engineer some new descriptors using the descriptor language to better capture those. Um, and it's, you know, it is one of the cool things, uh, hopefully you, you got some exposure to on this previous tutorial, that with the descriptors, you can really, you know, you can make anything you want to just about, it's actually a Turing complete language, the descriptor language. So, um, you know, this is the biggest part of it really is, is uh, that data set sanitization and then coming up with the features you want. Um, which I guess that's actually this part more, the generate training features. So uh, distributed with the BCL, we have a feature code object file. Um, what that is, is just a, a simple text file that indicates what descriptors we're gonna calculate for each molecule. And um, 
And similarly, a result code object file, which just says, well, what are the results? What are we actually trying to predict? Um, and uh, potentially one can also do dimensionality reduction. We, we rarely do, but uh, it's possible to do PCA with the BCL uh, to reduce your um, descriptor set down further. Um, in practice, it's, it's of, uh, I would say, relatively limited utility, uh, except if you have uh, the case where you have very, very, very small uh, training data set and um, you need to, it to generalize really well. Um, configuration and training. So here we have sort of our uh, hyperparameters for the training. Uh, you need to configure the training options. Uh, I believe in this tutorial, we, we provide you with a, a configuration file that already has sort of our most common settings and um, then just run the training. Um, for the models. And so we'll, we'll get more into what that actually entails in a bit. Um, but, and then the last part, uh, very important is of course validation. Uh, in the BCL, uh, unlike I think most software packages, uh, it's already been custom configured to always do random or uh, to always do cross validation for you and to compute the validation scores on the holdout sets already averaged out and everything. So um, that's already taken care of for you, but if you wanna do some more, um, so, some better forms of validation, depending on what types of uh, scenarios you intend to use your model for, such as time split, um, those are also possible to do as well. They just require some more um, additional uh, coding around that, or just scripting around that, I should say. Um, one of the, one of the things that we try to, well, when we, when we go to use our models in the wild, uh, and we want to actually collaborate with experimentalists, uh, chemists, and so forth. Oftentimes, what they care about is um, how likely is this given compound that you've predicted to be active. Um, and so we'll get to that a little in a little bit more, a little bit later. Okay, I guess actually that's more the next slide. I should talk about this one more. This is log AUC. So, but what we care about most is being able to predict active compounds early on in uh, a very high score. Even if we miss a lot of them, we really want the, uh, to recover some uh, at a very low false positive rate. And so the most common sort of metric that we use to actually assess the model is this log AUC, which is really just this integral um, that you see here between a, a, a specified false positive rate between 0.001 and 0.1. And, um, that's what we most commonly use for this. It's very, very stable to uh, small changes in the model, unlike enrichment, which um, there's a lot of noise that goes along with uh, computing enrichments if you're just looking at that, which is one of the other common metrics people look at. Um, okay, this is what I was gonna talk about, local PPV. So to, to actually know how likely a compound is to be active, um, you know, you could just take the model's prediction uh, directly and try and, and, and use that um, to state how likely a compound is to be active. But the fact is that when you train a neural network, um, it's not a cal calibrated output. So what that means is that the outputs do not, are not actually, cannot be interpreted as probabilities directly. But in the BCL, we have um, a thing called local PPV, which can actually translate the model's output into the probability that this uh, compound is active based on all of our training data. This is what our best guess would be. Um, and so you can kind of see the uh, difference here between a few different other methods. So probably the most common way that people will uh, try to assess compound activity is they'll just report the PPB of a compound, but that represents an overestimate um, of how likely the compound is to be active as you see here on this red curve. Um, because it actually includes all the compounds that were predicted at higher uh, prediction probability as well. It's because, it's because it's everything greater than X. Um, so with local PPV, we're just looking at in at very small uh, intervals here, how likely are these compounds to be active? And so this is already kind of baked into the BCL and the, the training protocols that we usually use. So it's just something we wanted to introduce you to here to kind of get you familiar with that concept. Um, the idea that we, in the end, we really want to be able to deliver a probability of a compound being active to the user. Um, all right, I think- I'm doing validation. Yeah, you're doing validation. All right, 
this is everybody's favorite topic. Um, I like I like validation as a topic um, in large part because of um, the types of stuff that we discussed previously um, when we were doing the feature data set and and uh, you know if you don't validate your models appropriately you're going to have um, unrealistic expectations for how they're going to perform as Jeff said in the wild um, <laughs> or on, uh, on test cases and so um, there are several different ways in which you can validate and for folks who are who are accustomed to building machine learning models. Um, this may not be be new to you, um, but typically you start with some amount of data. These are the data that you are going to train your model with. So they have, in the case of supervised learning, like our standard feed forward uh, neural networks, these have um, all of the result labels on there. Um, we know what's an active, what's an inactive if we're doing a classification task, or we know what the property value is that we care about regressing over if we're doing a, a regression task. Um, Random split cross-validation, in the case of, for example, five-fold cross-validation, it says, let's go ahead and split our data set into five chunks randomly. And so this will be a random distribution. Um, then what we do is we train on four of those chunks and we test on one of them. And so this is the holdout set. It is just a random split from the rest of this. Then what we can do is, is do this on each of the five different ways in which you can leave out one of those and then test on the other, or train on the other four. Um, and so this is, um, you know, a, a pretty standard split. Some people will do tenfold cross-validation. Some people will do leave one out cross-validation, which is the most optimistic. You effectively train on all of the data except one training point and then make a prediction and cycle through that and do it for every single um, training point in your data set. Um, and so, you know, it, when you then want to screen a data set, so real life stuff, you know, you, you find a data set somewhere. Um, as long as that data set is very similar to um, what you trained with, your model is probably going to make, uh, you're, you're probably going to be able to interpret your model pretty close to literally. So when Jeff said that uh, our model output is going to be converted into a probability that a compound is active, that holds in the scenario where your training data um, and your testing data are essentially pulled from the same distribution. Um, in real life, um, we have all of the data, we do the five-fold random splits, we train on all the different chunks, we get stuff. Um, oftentimes, the data are not similar to our training data. So this is a different colored box because it represents that our data are, are slightly different. So what that means is that the, the probability of activity that our model is going to be translated into um, may not be the most accurate. Mm -hmm. um, now, there's something else that Jeff mentioned earlier called applicability domain Cajonan. And so you can train additional supplementary models that will tell you, hey, um, is this train, is this test compound? Is this molecule or, or whatever over here? Um, is it too different from my training set for me to make a reliable prediction at all? And so you can have um, sort of this, this supplementary model that we frequently train with our neural networks, a Cajonan map um, that we can use, which is a, a form of unsupervised uh, modeling. Um, and we can go ahead and, and use that to try to predict what test compounds are going to be unreliable predictions. But this is sort of a gradient. You have situations where your molecules are within the domain of applicability. So you can make um, reliable predictions in some sense but in which the, um, the actual predicted probability um, is going to be less accurate. Um, and so how do, we, how do we get around that? So if, if, if in those scenarios, our, our data are going to be sort of over optimistic representations at training time compared to test time, how can we potentially get a, a bottom level uh, of how our performance on the QSAR will be? Um, and so just to emphasize that further, um, when you do random split cross-validation, your model is testing itself internally on, on a distribution that is essentially identical to, to the other, um, to the training set. Um, and so it represents sort of a best case scenario type of, of training validation. We can also do effectively a worst case scenario um, within the limit of, of a domain of applicability. Um, and so one thing that you can do is actually take your molecules um, for training, so you can take that whole big data set and instead of just splitting them up randomly, we can split them into sort of different parts of the feature space that we're interested in. So we can do um, what we call a leave class out validation. So this is where you train your models um, on splits that were generated from, um, from uh, 
these these sort of property based clusters. Um, you can do the fivefold cross validation again, and then when you encounter real world data that are not similar to to your other data. Um, it, it's going to be a little bit, uh, it's not going to give you as good of a prediction. Your model's probably going to predict that everything's going to be worse. Um, but um, you can do this to sort of obtain, obtain a sobering estimate of how well your model generalizes to, to the feature space, um, sort of, you know, like I said, more generally. Um, you can also do um, a, you know, a, a hybrid of these things where what you do is you start off with sort of a, a training that the a random split cross validation, you train a model like that. And then to test that model um, on on a, on a you know a more real life scenario, you then make uh, separate chunks of data, or you have a secondary holdout set, um, and in that secondary holdout set, you you do some property clustering or or something like this. the The point is, um, you want to test your model rigorously in in different scenarios. And so, um, one example of this is in protein ligand interactions. Um, and so, I talked earlier about how um, a number of papers came out that looked at using different types of neural networks or different types. Uh, really, the, the, the big issue is when you used um, graph convolution neural networks or protein ligand complexes, and you're really just taking um, you're just taking voxelized representations of the protein ligand interface that actually contain separate components of both the protein and the ligand together. Um, what, what, you know, Rari's group and other folks found out is that oftentimes the neural network just went ahead and memorized something about the small molecules without actually learning anything about the, the interaction between the small molecule and the protein. Um, and so, and so, you know, um, you want to be able to, to probe your models in more ways than just random split cross validation. And so, um, this is a paper we published semi recently. It's um, you know, it's an interesting paper, and it's mostly interesting to me personally as the, as the person who primarily you know worked on it um, with, with respect to this figure right here, which is like figure three in the paper or something. Um, so we trained um, essentially a set of uh, neural networks to do a regression task to predict binding affinity, um, and we used. Um, we used a sort of a variant of autocorrelations. We used pair correlations between atoms in the small molecule and atoms in the protein, um, really correlations between the properties of atoms in the small molecule and atoms in the proteins, which was kind of a, a fun extension. Um, and, and then we can validate our models a few different ways. And so we can do standard bifold cross-validation, random split, BCL affinity net is the name of the model that we trained. And then we can look at our correlation coefficient and our normalized mean absolute error. Um, we really just care, you know, we can, we can look at correlation coefficient for simplicity. So it's this orange bar. We want this to be higher. Um, and then we can also train a ligand-based uh, deep neural network. So the ligand-based neural network will just go ahead and look at the small molecule descriptors. It will not look at the protein ligand interface. Now, this should be complete garbage um, because we have a bunch of proteins and small molecules in complex with one another. Um, and so the actual affinity, the value, arises out of the interactions of the small molecule protein sort of complex interactions. In other words, I could have the same small molecule represented in the data set multiple times, but it's going to have a different result label depending on what it was complexed with. Um, and if you just give it the ligand data with uh, the labels from the protein ligand, you know, from the, from the binding affinity, um, because in this case, we're not doing a single protein target. We're using multiple protein targets. Um, you would expect for it to, to train very poorly, to not be able to make a good prediction. But the neural network is convinced with random split cross-validation that it can do this really well. Um, and then when you actually go and you test it later on, you find that it can't be used at all for any type of validation purpose. And so what we did is we used uh, applicability domains, actually, to create... Um, feature sets uh, to create training sets that um, had their splits clustered by um, sort of similar feature space and different feature space. And, and sort of the sh short story, the short ending to this is um, using these paracorrelation features for the protein ligand interactions generalized very well such that it, the, the protein ligand interaction network um, did look like it was learning something. It could make pretty similar predictions um, on this split as it could on the random split. But then when you went to the control data sets that were based purely on ligand-based descriptors for all these different you know, protein targets, um, it performed really poorly. Same with our, our pocket-based network. And so um, we would not have really been able to say how well our network had generalized unless we had done these, these splits right here. And so um, when you're thinking about building QSTAR models for a variety of different tasks, it's just really important to think about 
how do you want to validate your model? Um, and so the key takeaways, you know, we use log AUC for early enrichment. We use local PPV because it creates a very intuitive, probabilistic interpretation of our output. Um, and if you want to know more about that, um, we can certainly chat with you about that. Um, be critical of your models and consider, you know, sort of um, how to do validation and applicability domain. Uh, in the last 10 minutes, I actually want to show you something kind of fun, um, which is which is a, a ligand um, graphical user interface sort of design app um, that a long time ago when I first rotated in the lab. So I've been in the lab for four and a half years and uh, I rotated in 2015 for other reasons. Um, at school's lame. Um, anyway, <laughs> uh, Jeff's laughing, but we... Um, there was a, a really great um, uh, research programmer in the lab. Her name is Karuna. Karuna is working on a um, user interface for uh, the BCL to do ligand-based drug design. Um, and she was collaborating with Jeff Mendenhall for this, who you just heard from. Um, and, so, and so prior to Richard, Jeff was our senior developer for a number of years. Um, and so um, this is sort of like Foldit. For those of you who are familiar with Foldit, um, it's not gamified. And so it's not really trying to reach the same audience. Um, and it's not structure-based. And so structure-based meaning in Foldit, you're trying to design a ligand to interact with the protein. So you're trying to optimize the interactions of the, the protein and the ligand together. Um, this is a ligand-based drug design sort of software project. Um, and it, it has, um, for its scoring function, just QSAR models that you, the user, can build. And so um, I'll just kind of navigate you through it. So over here, we've got sort of our 2D drawing board where we can make our molecules. Over on the right, we have a 3D representation of the molecule that is made with the BCL conformer generator. Um, this app, by the way, is horribly out of date with the rest of the BCL, and we'll get to that at the end, um, but this is our, our older conformer generator. Um, and then uh, down here in the bottom left, we have uh, sort of a list of properties that you can change if you'd like um, that tells you something about the, the molecule in question. So we've got three, I think, log P predictors in the BCL. You can count H-bond donors and acceptors. You can count aromatic rings. PPSA and rotatable bonds. So these are all things that are important um, for drug likeness. Um, and so as you're building your molecule, you can track like, hey, does it have features that I think are um, going to make it a good hit candidate for, for uh, additional medicinal chemistry? Um, you can see it in two different formats. And then you also get uh, a readout of the activity. So let's go ahead and try to play with this molecule. And full disclosure, I was playing with this for fun the other day. Um, but what we're going to look at are these activity labels over here. Um, I guess I should also emphasize we've got four different QSAR models here. We have four different local PPV estimates, one for each QSAR model. And then we have a form of applicability domain model over on the right, um, where it's going to, to tell us um, how confident we are that the model applies to, um, to, the, uh, to the QSAR model of interest uh, based on the feature space of the molecules. Um, and so we can go ahead and, and we can change the molecule. Maybe we don't want this this thing over here. I'm not a medicinal chemist, so so maybe the medicinal chemistry people can be like, hey, we should make some some substitutions. And so how did that go? We deleted some parts of the molecule. Ah, okay. When we deleted that part of the molecule, our, our predicted activity went from 0.18 to 0.26 approximately. So we're moving in the right direction. Uh, maybe we want to put something else down here. It did have some other stuff, so maybe we can add a couple carbon atoms. That worked. Did that do anything for me? Uh, no, bump me back down to 0.28. Okay, I don't want to. I don't want to do the carbon atoms. Maybe you know, I hear that fluorines are magical. Maybe we should put some fluorines on here. Um, oops, except I. I'm going to use Control Z. Da -da. Add some fluorines because fluorines make all chemistry better. Uh, yeah, see, look, it does make all chemistry better. It's up to 0 0.31. And so this makes, uh, you know, the interpretation here is that I bumped my molecule from having a 25% ability to be, or 25% probability of being active based on my QSAR model to having a 31% chance of being active based on my QSAR model. Uh-oh, Nina says you can't hear me. Um, hopefully you guys can hear me. Okay, Mort says we can hear me. Sorry, Nina. You can watch this later. Um, I'm almost done. Anyway, the point is uh, the BCL user interface is something that uh, we are, are pretty interested in. We haven't had anyone developing it for a few years. Um, it's a project that's very interesting to us. Um, Jens also has this vision of putting the BCL on an iPhone or a smartphone of some kind. 
Um, so that way you can do two dimensional structure activity relationship modeling um, on an airplane, you know, or, or wherever you want to be. Um, and so we're really interested in sort of um, the same idea with Foldit, where you can do structure based drug design, um, making sort of a, a ligand based drug design application or, or user interface. So that way, whether you're a novice user or a medicinal chemist or a computational chemist or whatever else, uh, some other type of scientist, um, you can you can make use of these models in a, in a very user friendly format. Um, I certainly very frequently like to um, tinker with my molecules manually in addition to to generate them with these other automated or semi-automated processes. So anyway, um, I really like that. That's sort of an extension of, of you know, the BCL and the, and the user interface form. Um, I think I think that's everything for right now, unless you guys have questions. Um, if you have questions, we're happy to take them. Otherwise, we're happy to continue working with people as you go through the tutorials. So, um, so yeah, that's it. I have a question. Oh yeah, yeah. Where where can I get this uh, fancy GUI to uh, down to be able to just sit here and play with molecules all day? Have you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. So so there are some limitations with the GUI at the moment because it still actually uses the CSD Rotomer library, which is not open source, and so there's some licensing restrictions on it. Um, and so we can't distribute it at the moment. It's it's really only for labs that have the CSD thing, and so we really really desperately need um, some manpower to to help us um, develop. That well, basically, the first thing would be to make it use the, the open source library that, that you made the rest of the BCL use. Yeah, so anyway, just sort of fun future stuff. Anyway, other other questions, other thoughts? So, hey, how does how do you think about this? I'm just I'm very new to the BCL, this has been a lot of yeah. fun. How do you sort of think about these things you're showing in the context of commercial products like Mo that you know seem to have a lot of small mo molecule handling or? That may be an unfair question if you haven't worked with things like that. So I've definitely worked with Mo quite a bit in the past. Um, so first off, um, I Mo is not the easiest to use, at least for me personally, um, outside of their user interface. They've got this SVL scripting language, and it's not very easy to learn how to use that. I think the command line interface for the BCL is a lot easier. It's also a lot more extensible. And so there's a lot of modularity to the different applications in the BCL that we try to preserve. Um, a lot of interoperability between different components too. So you'll find that things in the chemistry namespace make use of a lot of things in the descriptor namespace and, and so on. Um, I like Mo's user interface a ton. I think it's fantastic. Um, when we start to get into the reaction-based drug design, which is tutorial for tomorrow, and then the alchemical drug design, you're going to start to see how a lot of the tools that we have in the BCL are very similar to what you can do with Mo. And I'd argue even more customizable because the algorithms in Mo, some of them are really cool. I like them, um, but they sort of do what they do. There's not a whole lot of, of you know, you, you can't really change them all that much. So with a better UI and some other things, we should have uh, 10,000 users too. Yeah, I mean, really with some advertising too, right? I mean, this is probably the first time anyone, a lot of people have ever even been exposed to the BCL. We, we have done a, a poor job advertising, I think, in, in a lot of contexts. And so... Um, a UI would be great if you're not familiar with the command line or you want to tinker. Um, also, in fairness, we, a lot of the drug design tools are pretty new. And so you're going to be working with the alchemical design framework. You're going to be learning how the alchemical design framework can be used to perform enamine style reactions. You will also be working with the reaction design framework written originally by Alex Jeans. Um, these are all things that have sort of appeared over the last few years. And so they're, not, you know, they're not as, as um, we don't have any papers on any of these things. Like we're writing the only papers on them right now. And so, you know, yeah. Anyway, it's also free, I guess, too. Mo costs a lot of money. And I actually tried to get a license from Mo as an individual. And they told me they don't sell individual license um, because I was like, I really want one for um, just my own projects. Um, so, so, yeah. Cool. Thanks, Chris. All right. Awesome. Hey ben, I have a quick question. Yeah. Um, when you go about looking at um, the importance of different features, I mean, how, I mean, you go in and you want to reduce that dimensionality. I know it was mentioned, but you didn't talk very much about how you do that. Is that like an iterative process? How do y'all usually go about that? Yeah, so I'll let Jeff talk about feature selection in just a moment. There's a few different ways you can do um, dimensionality reduction. So one of the ways is just through, uh, there's, a, there's something that you'll play with in the tutorial. Um, 
It's called generate PCA eigenvectors. And so you can actually take your feature set that you create in the BCL and you can um, ask it, you know, you can, you can essentially create, um, take another operation of your, of your feature set and try to um, say like, oh, I want, you know, 95% variance explained and it will go ahead and it will reduce your, your dimensionality down to however many bins it needs to explain that variance. And so that's one very straightforward way to, to do dimensionality reduction. Um, Another part of that question though is feature selection, right? So oftentimes you have a bunch of features, let's say 1300 features or something, and not all of them are important. And so how do you go about pruning those? Um, and, and we have, um, there's something called input sensitivity where you can actually look at the contribution of each weight uh, connecting each of the nodes, uh, each of the neurons in your, in your network to see how much it contributes towards the actual final result label or the final output. Um, and you can you can perturb those those weights and then see how much they affect. Uh, and I think Jeff's implementation does this fast by going just the inverse process, right? Where you yeah. perturb them. Yeah. Um, but the general idea is you can you can see um, by perturbing the the weights effectively how important are each of the features um, to the model's output. And so what's the most salient to the model? And if you train five models in your five-fold cross-validation, you can also look at a level of consistency between each of the models. So are the models all predicting that changing this weight a particular way reduces their performance or improves their performance? Um, and so looking for consistency is one way of seeing um, reliability about descriptors. But I think you can probably talk a little bit more about this topic. Yeah, so, um, and that's actually, you know, it's it's integrated into BCL to be able to do that with the data set scoring. In fact, with the configuration file that I think is in this um, particular mm -hmm. Uh, example, you already see there's a data set scoring thing where you can actually go in and, and mess around with uh, different weights and stuff. But um, usually the way we would do this is um, it's beneficial to not go down this road too far. Basically, you want to look at what sorts of general features are important, but uh, over-optimizing this, we've, we've definitely learned that uh, it's very easy to over-optimize uh, based on your feature set. And we've definitely seen this in the literature too, where people have just went nuts kind of with um, with actually just over optimizing their their descriptor set for a particular problem. So what we recommend people do is after say doing a, a round or two of data set scoring, you go in and you kind of look at some of the general things that seem to be important for your model and um, and what things are generally just seeming to be confusing and then just maybe try removing one or two of those groups, but remove them as a group. So remove all 48 bins or whatever of your 3DA rather than just removing one thing at, uh, or another, at like one cow, one bin of a giant histogram or something at a time. And so let me clarify on that point because that's, that's a, really good, a really good point. Um, when, you're, when you're doing your, your data set um, sort of feature selection, um, like Jeff is saying, if you have an autocorrelation and it's doing an autocorrelation in 3D space across the polarizability property, for example. So you're looking at the polarizability, you know, sort of pair correlations between all the atoms. Do not go in and just remove the bins that are like, oh, the low information bins or the inconsistent bins um, so that you've got like, oh, well, we look at four angstroms, but not four and a half angstroms, but then five angstroms, but then not five and a half angstroms, right? You want to just say, is polarizability important or is it not important? Um, so looking at them sort of uh, in, in these chunks of categories is better. I think also just, I don't know, increasing dropout and letting it run longer and seeing if I think that that's usually a good way to go instead of doing too much feature selection. Yeah, generally we we try to um, I, well, generally as long as your features don't have too much redundancy or too much noise, yeah. then you know you don't need to increase drop that much at all. So it's really if you're finding that basically the the, the key giveaway that you have to, a bunch of junk in your data set is that your um, dropout you need to actually increase your dropout to improve performance. So if you find that increasing input dropout improves your performance, it means you got a bunch of noise and junk in your data set. That's a good, a really good tell that you need to go in and find some features to remove, find some junk to remove. Um, and it's something where if you use kind of our handcrafted uh, feature sets, um, they're generally not too subject to that because we've already kind of removed the ones that we sort of know that are already subject to that the most. So unless you use them on a really tiny data set, generally you won't run into it. Cool. Really good question, Shannon. Um, the BCL Affinity Net paper has input sensitivity examples in the supplement as well, and so I can always attach that to the to the GitHub page as a reference for how to do input sensitivity analysis on your model. Thanks for that very thorough answer, guys. <laughs> yeah, hope it was uh, not overkill, but no, important great. question.
All right, go do tutorials. We'll be around. Thanks, everybody.